we are creating a format here with brilliant intellectual leadership like Mary and like Richard Alderson, having such a fantastic woman historian here tonight again with us, Lucy McDiarmid. Angela Bork said, few books published for the centenary of 1916 will be as original, as entertaining, and as thoroughly researched, or as well written, as this analysis of women's words, ideas, and action during the Easter Rising and the Hoth gun running that preceded it. So over to you, Lucy. Thank you very much. My book gives an alternative history of the one-week rebellion, Irish rebellion known as the Easter Rising. It's alternative because I focus not only on the women, but on the women's own words. My sources are what the women wrote about their experiences in the Rising. And so they come from the Bureau of Military History witness statements. And those are all online in the uh, URL, the address is in this book if you want to look them up. They make wonderful reading. Uh, the women's diaries, memoirs, and autobiographies, um, and also some unpublished manuscripts. Um, and also, because my interest is gender, um, I also include unionist women, though tonight, since I'm talking about um, the rising itself, uh, there are no unions in it. Um, what's really different about my book is that I look at what the sociologist Irving Goffman calls small behaviors. By that phrase, Goffman means behaviors like glances, gestures, physical positioning, and verbal statements. I'm interested in small questions, not large ones. In today's talk, for, in for instance, I'm not asking, was the rising a good thing? Was the rising a bad thing? I'm asking, how did the women get into the garrisons? And the reason I'm interested in this approach is that these small behaviors reveal social change in process. The unofficial history of access to a door or a leap through a window or very short conversations. Um, and there was a lot of social change to reveal because 19, in 1916 in Ireland, as in many Western countries, gender roles were uncertain and unstable. And uh, now we're going to go to, let's see, the left side. Ah, there we go. Um, this is just a little bit of background so you can understand the instability. Um, at this time, women were enthusiastic members of nationalist organizations, but they were unable to vote. The Irish Women's Franchise League, and those are dates of the founding of those organizations, worked with dedication and occasional violence to secure the vote for Irish women. But women's positions in the nationalist organizations were not consistent. The Ladies' Land League from 1881 came into being when the men were in prison, and when the men got out of prison, they disbanded it. The women were too activist and too energetic, uh, too radical. The cultural organization Inini Naheran, Daughters of Ireland, um, was folded into Komenaman, the Women's Council, in 1914. But even Komenaman's own members didn't agree about whether it was an auxiliary to the all-male volunteers or independent. And the Irish Citizen Army was an offshoot of the labor movement, and in that, men and women were more equal, but it was a very small organization. There were only 300 people in it altogether, and 28 women from it uh, were in the rising, and about 175 women in Kamanaman. The proclamation of the Republic, which the consul was mentioning, held out the promise of equal rights and equal opportunities for all citizens, but how those ideals would work in practice was uncertain in April 1916, and some would say a century later. So it was this unsettled situation with women sort of men's equals in the public sphere and sort of not that was expressed and embodied in the small behaviors that appear in almost all the women's accounts of 1916. There we have a map of the rising, um, and moreover, there was no law, no precedent, no consistent policy about what women could or couldn't do in an armed rebellion. 
The rising was fought in Garrison's um, position in an oval around the center of Dublin, though the oval you see is actually roads and not the rising. But the little, the numbers in the circles are the garrisons. Um, you see, let's see, the, see the number one up there, that's the GPO, the General Post Office, which is the one I'm going to be talking about most. The rising lasted for one week before the rebels surrendered to the British forces who had been bombing them from a gunboat on the River Liffey. The common, each garrison had a commandant. The commandants of the garrisons had to create policies on the spot whenever a gender-related situation arose. Each situation required a conscious choice. What do we do? The male leaders had to improvise. And so because the women's accounts record what they saw and what they did, they reveal all the instabilities of the moment. So my interest lies in seeing how social change plays out in actual encounters in the field. And so we're going to look at the specific issue of women's access to the garrisons. How did they get in them so they could be part of the rising? Well, look at what happened at Jacob's Biscuit Factory, the garrison commanded by Thomas McDonough. On Easter Monday, Maura Nihuli, Abbey Theater actress, um, with five other Kumanaman women, um, deliberately went to Jacob's because she, she knew Thomas McDonough and she liked him. Um, she was very fond of him. And she said his good humor never faltered under any circumstances. So she went to, she went to the entry of Jacob's and McDonough was there. And his first response was surprise. He said, my god, it's Maura Walker. How did you get in? And she said that he seemed very much at ease. And then he looked at her and he said, we haven't made any provision for girls here. So she made her case. She said, we can be very useful. We can help with the cooking, and we can uh, take, look after casualties. Um, and he said the 1916 equivalent of all right. Um, and so they went in. So the, um, he wasn't deliberately discriminatory. He just hadn't thought about it. Um, he hadn't thought, oh, women can help out. But he must have known Kumanaman existed, but he, he hadn't thought about it, so he let them in. But what interests me is that there's the same problem at the end of the week, when the battalion in Jacobs was surrendering to the British. Um, and here I'm looking at, so what you heard quoted there was Maura Nehuli's autobiography, The Splendid Years. Um, on Sunday, April 30th, at the end of the rising, two women, whom we'll hear about later, Louise Gavin Duffy and Min Ryan, were walking around, watching, looking at the surrenders. They wanted to see what was happening. And they happened to be at Jacobs just at the moment when Brigadier General Lowe was there to take Thomas McDonough's surrender. Um, and this is what Min Ryan wrote in her account. So they're, they're standing there, they're, they're watching the general going into the garrison, make the men surrender. Min writes, I suppose the high-ranking officer was General Lowe. The young officer stood, and we stood too. Louise stood up with great dignity. One of the officers said, we're not taking women, are we? The other said, no. Louise said, the cheek of him anyway, not taking women. Um, <laughs> So but when you put the two episodes together, though, you see that you can slice the rising another way. It isn't just British and Irish. It's also divided by gender. The, both the British general and the Irish rebel had to face the same dilemma. What do we do about women? The small behaviors show you how, given the lack of any policies related to gender, everyone had to improvise. And precisely because everyone had to improvise, you can see social change being played out in these encounters in the field. People had to pause and think about gender. Are we taking women? In fact, they did take women to prison, but not, not then, not at that moment. In fact, most of the women in Jacobs didn't go to prison. Um, but they, they already had some women in prison at that point. But they, they had to think about it every time they saw them. Um, they had to articulate an, in, an immediate policy about girls, um, just as McDonough had to, um, because they maybe require something special, more privacy, a different kind of toilet, whatever it is, women were not the norm, men were the norm. Uh, 
Now, there were two garrisons that didn't need to improvise a policy. At the College of Surgeons on Stevens Green, the Irish Citizen Army had a man in charge, Michael Mallon, and a woman, second, Constance Markovich. And women there had guns and were active shooters. And Margaret Skinner has written an autobiography, Doing My Bit for Ireland, about that. So they were set. There were women there, and they had guns, and they were shooting. At the other extreme is um, Boland's Mills, where De Valera was in charge. And he had a policy, no women. Um, and here's what he said about that in a dialed debate in 1937, when people were still thinking about this issue, 21 years later with the new constitution. And here's what Dev said, trying to get back into his frame of mind from 1916 and remember why had he excluded women. He said, we, I said, we have anxieties of a certain kind here, and I do not want to add to them at the moment by getting untrained women women who were clearly untrained for soldiering. I did not want them as soldiers in any case. I'm not saying for a moment that they may not fight as well as men. That was not the question I had to decide. But I said I did not want them. I did appreciate their services, but I didn't want to accept any such work at the time. But he later said he regretted that policy because without women, some of his best soldiers had to do the cooking and the, the women's work. And it would have been much better if he'd let the, the women do that. But that was much later. Um, so those garrisons are the extreme. But in the other garrisons, there was usually a kind of a little bump or a little obstacle when women entered, especially when they entered alone and not as part of a unit from Kumanaman. And my favorite example of a little obstacle is the one encountered by Kate Byrne. And she tells this story twice, once in her pension application and once in her um, bureau witness statement. Uh, this was a newspaper article from 1966 at the 50th anniversary. I should say the Byrne family was wonderful when we were able to find them. They gave us three family pictures, and we only used one in the book, but I'm going to show you all three because I love these pictures. And I think they were particularly grateful because she wasn't one of the famous people like Markovich and Skinner and so forth. Um, she was from a relatively obscure family, uh, but they were all active in the Rising. And in the story I'm about to tell, her brother Patty is mentioned. Patty is the second, in the picture at the top, he's the second from the right. Um, there were 13 children. You'll see more of them later. She was one of 13. On Monday, April 24th, 1916, just after 12 noon, Kate Byrne, 21 years old, jumped into the general post office in Dublin. It was the first day, in fact, the first minutes of the rising. And Kate was on her way home after a walk with her sister Alice when she learned from a male friend that the fight was starting. And when she got home, her brother had already left to join his battalion of the volunteers. And her mother urged her and her sister to go out. Um, Byrne was a member of Kumanaman. She followed her brother into action. And she fell in behind a company of volunteers led by Captain Michael Staines. And as she says, at Nelson's Pillar, Staines gave the order, right turn. So I did the right turn, too. But Staines, so this is one woman marching at the end of this long line of male volunteers. Um, but Staines wouldn't let Byrne into the post office with his men. He threatened her with the nearest male in her family, her older brother. And he said, I'll tell Patty on you. <laughs> That's Patty. Um, as if the brother's moral authority would weigh heavily on the sister's conscience, and as if the combined manhood of family and military would offer a sufficiently discouraging obstacle. Um, and you, you've seen Patty in the picture. Um, but denied access through the main entrance in the, to the GPO, Byrne just waited for another opportunity. And this is how she describes her dramatic entry. I hung around and spotted Frank Murtaugh. The volunteers had broken in the front windows of the office, but the side windows had not yet been broken. I asked Frank Murtaugh to lift me up to the side window at the corner where the stamp machine is now. He did this with the aid of another volunteer, 
and I kicked in the glass of the window. It was a closed window, okay, it wasn't open. I jumped in and landed on Joe Gahan, who was stooping down inside performing some task. He started swearing at me, asking, what the bloody hell are you doing here? I have to say, in the two versions, she has different kinds of swearing, but I, <laughs> I like this one. I like, what the bloody hell are you doing here? That one's better. Um, and then Gan, when she landed on when she jumped in, pointed out to her that she was bleeding all over, because she had just jumped through glass, you know, and it was, first she kicked it in, then she jumped, so she was cut all over. Um, but then a wounded man was brought in, and he said to her, here's your first case. So she was immediately uh, put to use. I'm going to get to. This is my favorite picture. It's not in the book. In the middle is the proud Mrs. Byrne with all of her daughters. She had sons also, but with all of her daughters. Uh, if you want to ask me later about what she did for Ireland, I can tell you because she was very active also. But the the jumper the jumper is the second from the left. And her sister Alice, who also went out but went to another garrison, is the second from the right. What I like about this story is that every moment reveals Byrne negotiating small obstacles associated with gender. Except in the case of Staines, these surmountable obstacles do not arise from a policy of discrimination. And even Staines probably wouldn't have kept her out if she had waited for her mobilization order, which did come to her house, but her mother said, go, your brothers are out, go. Um, so they went. They were too early. Um, but nevertheless, you can see how every stage of her progress, from home to useful work inside the GPO tending the wounded, is characterized by a slight gender-driven delay. The news of the rising reaches the men first. The women have to hear about it. She falls in at the end. She's turned away at the door. Um, she has to find somebody she knows to lift her to the window, and then she's cursed before she's put to useful work. Um, but all these little delays are not recorded in a tone of complaint, because her emphasis is on the work she did for the rebels. Now I have to, I'm going to digress to something slightly girly. Um, this is a digression from the feminist tone. This is, the, the, again, the family gave me these. I couldn't put them in the book. This is the double wedding of Alice and um, Kate Byrne. Kate is on your uh, right, and Alice is on the left. Um, so a nice little historical piece. But you notice all the men in uniform in the back. I mean, it had nothing to do with the book, but the family was so happy and just gave us all these pictures. So just a little bit of the girly stuff there. Um, and actually, now I'm going to turn to another story about access to the GPO um, from Min Ryan's account, which she wrote in 1950. Um, but in this case, the obstacles were internal and not external. So if you've enjoyed that picture enough, I'm not going to go to a different kind. Um, she was later married Josephine Mulcahy, but she's all, in 1916, she's Min Ryan. Um, she was from the Lord Ryan family in Wexford. She later married General Richard Mulcahy of the Free State Army. But in 1916, she was in love with Sean McDermott, one of the Rising's leaders. And in a letter he wrote before his execution, he referred to her as the woman who would have been his wife. Ryan spent the Monday morning of Easter week when the rising began working at the Four Courts garrison organizing the sending of messages. So she was busy with that. Um, and then word came that she wasn't needed anymore there. Um, and so what she said was, I remember a certain feeling of pleasure. I said, now we can go around and see what is happening. And that's always what she likes to do in the Rising. She's the one who was standing at the door of Jacobs when the British came. She liked to go and see what was happening. But in this case, it also meant to see her boyfriend, Sean McDermott, who was in the GPO. Um, and so she and another Kumanaman member um, walked toward the GPO, and they met Sean T. O'Kelly, who was later the president of Ireland and later also her brother-in-law. And he was leading a small group of men. And they went over to him, and he said, would you like to come into the post office? Would you like to see Sean McDermott? And so it was clear from the way he put it to her that he knew why she really wanted to go in. And she said, we would love that, but we're afraid to go in. 
And I think that response shows her awareness that the rising has changed the rules of engagement for herself and McDermott. She feels she can't just walk in and say hello to her boyfriend. She needs someone to mediate her access to him. And that hadn't happened before. And O'Kelly said, come along with me, because he was Pierce's staff officer, so he had powers of admission. But then once in the GPO, Lyon was embarrassed because there she was at the epicenter of a revolution looking for her boyfriend. And she writes, Shanti O'Kelly told Connolly who we were, and then he went off on business. I remember going to the back of the post office. I was looking for Sean McDermott. I was left on my own and looked exactly like the complete camp follower. She hadn't had any practice in managing two identities simultaneously, the useful Kamanaman member and the girlfriend following her man. And her embarrassment at searching for the man she loves in the middle of a war zone expresses itself in the suggestive term camp follower. And she had no guidelines. And she didn't have any official function in the GPO at that moment. Her only purpose was to find him. So she had to reframe the situation. It wasn't an ordinary day in Dublin when girl meets boy. It was an armed rebellion. Um, and then she couldn't even get to him because he had handlers, and they kept her away from him. Um, I said to Geroyd O'Sullivan, who is a sort of aide to Sean McDermott, I would like to see Sean McDermott. And he said, you can't, he's resting. And so she went home after that. But clearly, a new way of relating had to be invented. Ryan had to subordinate the romantic relationship to their roles in the revolution. She had to be invited into the GPO. She acquiesced to what the aide-de-camp said and went home. And the next day, when she returned with her sister, Phyllis, she, she deferred to the revolutionary situation and obeyed the orders she was given even when it meant delivering messages to people, which she did not want to do. She just wanted to hover around her man. And she said, we were always very sorry, as it meant leaving the GPO again. But I think her account is unashamedly honest, as she acknowledges her preference for staying where the men were, especially the one she loved. Um, and now, uh, there's enough, this, so we have right, the woman who jumped through the window, the woman who had to go through several men to get there. This woman met no obstacles whatsoever entering the GPO. Leslie Price and a friend, they were also working in the four courts and also sort of released from their job at one point. And they got a message that she and a friend got a message that said, go home and await further instructions. Um, and here's what she said. You know the volunteers, the kind of men they were. They thought we should be away from all that danger. However, this was where I showed lack of discipline. Breed Dixon and I decided that we were not going home. Here was something that would never happen in our lives again. We decided to go down to the center of the city, see what was going on, and get into any building that was available. Breed and I walked down O'Connor Street and went into the post office. I love it. They just went in. It's very simple for them. Uh, there we saw Sean McDermott, Tom Clark, Sean McGarry, Gerarda Sullivan, Michael Staines, and all those we knew in the Gaelic League, and we flew over to them. We knew all the north side people, but very few from the south side of the city. The two of us reported to Sean McDermott, and he told us that Louise Gavin Duffy was in charge of the commissariat, and that he was sending us there to help her. So it was very simple. They walk in, Nobody kicked them out. Sean McDermott isn't sleeping. There were no handlers, and they just go. Here's why Louise Gavin Duffy was in the commissariat. Um, she had a little conflict with Pierce when she entered the GPO, um, but she also was unobstructed. She walked in, but she'd been a teacher at school either, the girls' school that was part of St. Endes, where Pierce had been headmaster, so they knew one another. Um, and here's what she, she writes. When I got to the GPO, I was let in. I forget who was on guard. I asked to see Mr. Pierce. He was the only person I knew. I was brought into the post office, <clears throat> and I saw Mr. Pierce. He was as calm and courteous as ever. I now think it was very insolent of me, because I said to him that I wanted to be in the field, but that I felt the rebellion was a frightful mistake. It could not possibly succeed, and it was therefore wrong. 
I forget whether he said anything to that or whether he simply let it go. He certainly did not start to justify himself. I told him that I would rather not do any active work. I suppose what I meant was that I would not like to be sent with dispatches or anything like that because I felt that I would not be justified. He asked me would I like to go to the kitchen. I couldn't object to that and I went up to the kitchen at the top of the back of the building. So that's why she was there. She didn't want to shoot anybody or have anything to do with the violence, but she wanted, didn't want to be there under false pretenses. And that's also, by the way, um, that was also the feeling of Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, who was a pacifist, um, did not want to be in the garrisons, but she carried food uh, to the garrisons. Um, she wanted to support the nationalists up to a certain point. And now, Another picture that couldn't be used in the book because it was not photographically good enough, um, but it's a very interesting historical picture. I'm now going to talk about not only a less aggressive young woman, but a completely shy and unaggressive young woman, Marie Nichelli. Her account represents the rising as a space to be entered not with a jump, but with a series of tentative attempts. She was the sister of Sean T. O'Kelly. Um, he was president of Ireland. There he is. That's a photograph from our Sanuksharan, so it's probably one of, uh, when he was, after he was sworn in. And his sister, Mairead, about whom this story is, is in the middle row, the second from the right. And Min Ryan is also in that picture, the second row, the third from the left. So they're all, this is all the sort of Ryan O'Kelly family. They're all together. Um, uh, her, uh, Marie Nichelli's obituary says she led a very quiet life and was rarely seen publicly. And I, I thought that was very interesting to, to read that in her 1971 obituary because her witness statement describing what she did in 1916 was the statement of somebody who would later lead a quiet life, as you'll see. During Easter week, she was constantly trying to find a point of entry into the rising and a place to do useful work. Um, she, she couldn't get into it. No one was at the meeting place she'd been ordered to go to, so she and some other Kumanaman members went to a store north of Parnell Square, and she says they decided to turn the drawing room over the shop into an emergency hospital. But what happened, as she says, is that we, they discovered the fighting was not likely to come our way. They had no one to take care of, so they got rid of the hospital. And she was at a loss for what to do, so she went home to see how her mother was doing. You see the other women, they go out walking, they go to the center of action. But she went back to see how her mother was. She went out again the next morning, and she said to where I guessed my brothers were, down in the North King Street area. And she thought the males in her family might show her a route in. And eventually she joined a group of girls, that's her word, um, and cooked meals for the volunteers for several days. Um, but on Wednesday, she writes, this is Wednesday of Easter week, this is now a quote from Marie, the volunteers started to burrow through the houses, and after that, they did not let us go on the street at all. The volunteers made an attack on the Broadstone Station on that day, and we followed them with dressings but we were not let go too near them. As these memories indicate, the public space that she and the other women occupied was marked by degrees of proximity to the front line. The men didn't allow the women to leave the house where they were cooking and go into the street, and when the men attacked the enemy, the women were not let go too near them. And I think this is consistent with what Leslie Price says. She said, you know what kind of men the volunteers were. They wanted to keep us away from danger. So you have all of these eager, interested women and these chivalrous volunteers who don't want the women to get hurt. And by Friday, again by Friday, she left because she said, I did not appear to be doing work of any great value. Um, and she was also worrying about her mother and her younger brother, Michael. He's four years younger than she is, but he keeps saying, you know, you ought to go home to mother because she's quite alone. Um, and so she did go home. And to get home safely, she put her hair in braids or plates, as she calls it, so she would look very young, and she ultimately got there. Um, but her details map one woman's participation in the rising, the realm in which she and many 
but not all of the women in 1916 acted, exists in a kind of borderland or overlap between the private female world of household and family and the public male-dominated world of politics. The women Nicheli writes about in her witness statement were positioned in an area between the house and the front line. Whether she's cooking for the volunteers or following behind the battle lines with medical dressings, she's operating in a borderland, a territory in which women are using domestic skills to serve the military purposes of men. And now I'm going to conclude. This is a picture of all the women, not all the women in the rising, but all the ones who could make it to the photo op, not including the five still in jail in England at the time, um, taken in August of 1916. I just thought you should see them all at once. Um, here's my conclusion. What all these episodes show, I think, is the ambiguous situation of women in public space. As I suggested at the beginning, their situation as citizens was ambiguous because they couldn't vote, but they could be active to some extent in political organizations. To enter a 1916 garrison was to enter a male-dominated space where in some cases women were allowed and in some cases they weren't. In some cases they were in traditionally female roles, cooking and nursing, and in a few cases in a more typically male military role. But in no case were they the norm. I've read dozens of men's witness statements and memoirs also, and they don't have this repeated motif of the entry into the garrison. It's a small behavior that recurs in many of the women's accounts. The rising function to some extent like any bounded territory or site that men dominate and women wish to enter. Of course, this is to see the rising purely in terms of gender politics, but such a view is implicit in the women's accounts. For a woman to enter a garrison during an armed rebellion requires not only courage, but a bit of negotiation at the threshold. The women's presence in public space, wherever it was, gave them the authority to write and record. Thank you very much. That's, that's it. Um, and uh, so please identify who you are. Uh, you know, I, the ones who did were the women who were close to the men who were executed and went to say goodbye to them in Kil Kilmainham Jail. I have a chapter on that in this book called uh, The Kilmainham Farewell. And what I discovered from reading all of their accounts of saying goodbye to, let me see, in Dublin at that time, 14 men were executed. Two others executed later, but 14 then. There are lots of accounts of it, sometimes by three women who said goodbye to the same man, a mother, a sister, a girlfriend. And what I discovered is that they all, they told one another or they felt that they had to bear up when they said goodbye to the men. They couldn't break down in tears. They couldn't make a fuss. They couldn't say, oh my god, in three hours you're going to be shot. And They couldn't do that. They had to say, you're brave, you're wonderful, this is great, the Irish people will appreciate this. You're, you know, they had to do it, and that's what the men wanted. And, um, and I show how uh, the Daly sisters, Madge and Laura Daly, and their other sister, Kathleen Clark, met the sisters of Michala Hanrahan, um, Anna and Eileen, as they were arriving. And when Eileen O'Hanrahan learned that her brother was um, going to be executed, she thought he was just being transported to England for prison. When she learned he was going to be executed, she, she moaned and cried. And the Daly sisters said, and Kathleen Clark is the one Maureen was talking about before, it was, you know, a tough thing, said, Eile, you can't do that in front of me, Hall. You have to pull yourself together. Um, and so like the Daly sisters, they did. But to go to your question, when they were leaving, after they had left um, Michal's cell, the O'Hanrahan sisters, I don't know if you've been to Kilmainham Jail and seen that dreadful, terrifying stairway there, when she got to the bottom of it, I fainted. 
Um, Kathleen Clark had a miscarriage. She was pregnant. She didn't have her husband. She had a miscarriage. And so what I saw is that the women who had to be strong and brave when they said goodbye to these people, Maureen tells the story, she said they shook hands, but that's not in her autobiography, but apparently she, you know, they, they had to bear up and be brave, but later it was the, the sorrow that they couldn't express there came out in their bodies. And they, so that's the only instance that I've seen of something that is like uh, PTSD. Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, the hardest part, Maureen mentioned Nora Connolly's account of driving. He was, um, he was actually in Dublin Castle when they said but and he was later moved to Kilmainham. Um, they had to, the difficult thing was talking themselves into not crying. And what I saw was that there were two groups of men they had to not cry in front of. One was the men who were about to be shot but also the British soldiers who were guarding these men. They didn't want to look defeated. They wanted to look strong. And so I know Madge Daly says in the car when they're being driven to Kilmaine, Madge says to her sister Laura and her sister Kathleen, they're actually then going to see their brother um, before he's executed. So Kathleen went two nights in a row, one night to see her husband, the next to see her brother. Um, what Madge says is, remember, we are the daughters and nieces of Fenians. It's a, it's a wonderful quote. Um, I, whether she really said it to him, she probably did say it. She has a wonderful unpublished autobiography in the University of Limerick Library that I was able to read. It's, I, I've never seen it quoted, and I don't know if anybody else has read it except Kathleen Clark's family. Um, but how did it affect them afterwards? Um, well, I think certainly they were, they were strongly nationalist and very Republican, all of, all of those women, clearly. Um, I mean, and in, that's what Sinead McCool has written, a book called Easter Widows, and she would probably be talking more about the afterwards. I was focusing just on the Easter week thing. Um, but what interested me, a lot of, well, a lot of scholars are very skeptical about accounts written later, or a, a skeptical of the Bureau of Military History witness statements, which were taken between about 1947 and 1953. Um, but what I found is that when you can find several people writing about the same event, Eileen O'Hanrahan, Madge Daly, and Kathleen Clark all writing about the moment when Madge cried, they said, don't do that, you can't do that. So she doesn't cry, but then she comes and faints. They all describe it the same way. And there are other instances also where you, could, you find lots of women describing the events in the same way. So I was actually not skeptical of most of the witness statements I read, and particularly like for my favorite, Kate Byrne, who jumps through the window. She describes that over and over and over. I mean, she's, one reason she does is that she had trouble getting her pension because she hadn't come in officially. She'd come in in a very unofficial way. And her mobilization order came and she'd already left. So she had to find, so one of the things I print in the book is the letter from the man who lifted her up to the window saying that, and the letter from Joe Gahan, the man who swore when she dropped down onto him. They both wrote letters saying, yes, she did this. And you know, 30 years later, they hadn't forgotten it. So. Um, a lot of what I talk about, again, there, there are lots of witnesses who are talking about these things. Um, you, you spoke about how there was a lot of uh, situations where uh, men had to make a decision on how to deal with uh, the women, and it wasn't necessarily in a, in a bad way, it was just something, it was a new thing that mm -hmm. presented themselves where they, before, prior to this event, uh, they were not accustomed to women being involved in the fight mm -hmm. uh, in the way that Easter Rising was. Um, was there any way where, after the Easter Rising, onward to the revolution and then later the Civil War, where this set a foundation towards the, the increased role for women in those uh, future conflicts? Ah, uh, yes. Well, what's very interesting about that is that <coughs> the Easter is the difference in the military situation. The Easter Rising was, of course, fought out of these garrisons, which in, with hindsight, one can say it was a terrible idea. And John McBride, who was in Jacobs with um, McDonough, said, next time, don't do it this way. Go out in the country. You know, don't do it. This is a terrible idea. So 
the garrisons, because they were enclosed spaces, they generated the stories that I told, and many more like them, where you're either on the outside or you're on the inside. Once you're in, once you have flying columns in the War of Independence, it's totally different. I mean, the women are often, they're mostly, so far as I have heard, there are exclusively men in the flying columns, but the women in the houses are very important because they're hiding men on the run or they're cooking for them or they're, the houses are being raided. So it was a completely different military strategy, um, but still with very distinct gender roles. I mean, I, have, I, didn't, I didn't read all of the accounts of the... Um, the War of Independence, though there was a lot, the women were doing a lot of driving of ammunition around and, and so forth. Um, but uh, the strategy was so different. That, and I guess what I was going to say, I've never heard of a woman who wanted to be part of a flying column and was turned down. I hadn't heard of that. But they were so necessary to the strategy in, ah, but here's a story, I mean, totally of a way a woman was useful. There was a woman, I think, I think it was Galway, who a very nationalist woman who ran the switchboard there. And when I think some um, Irish uh, soldiers took over the, uh, the police barracks or something, she delayed the call to the help that would come. And she, and nobody, she did that for several years, all during the War of Independence, just mixing up things on the switchboard so that the Irish soldiers could always do whatever they needed to do, and the help never came to the people who were being attacked. And she was never discovered. Nobody ever suspected her. You know, she, it, it's hard to imagine what her demeanor must have been like, but so, there, were, there was a great variety of ways that women were helping the War of Independence, but, but not so far as I know in the flying columns. Well, let me, let me tell you what first comes to mind. Uh, the gender division in Kathleen the Houlihan is very clear and strict. Uh, the men are going off to die and the women are in the house. Um, up, distressed about it, and that's it. And Lady Gregory did not envision women fighting, but uh, Lady Gregory and Yates, that's 1902, though. Um, let me just answer that a slightly different way. Um, I just wrote an article on mothers in 1916 for the 1916 issue of History Ireland. And what I discovered is that mothers were quite activist. In Kathleen O'Houlihan, um, uh, Bridget Guillain is only saying Michael's not going to join the French and Michael's going to get married. Um, and also I should say Roy Foster's book Vivid Faces says that there's a strict generational division and that the older generation wasn't awakened to nationalism and the younger generation were all going off to fight. But I didn't find that in what I read. I found lots of mothers like Mrs. Byrne who was um, very active, Mrs. Byrne. I'm, uh, Mrs. Byrne once pretended to be the mother of somebody, a man in prison. He got released from prison so that he could see his dying mother, and she had to pretend to be the dying mother. But the people inspecting came earlier than she thought. She was in the kitchen baking, and so you saw what she looked like. She wasn't like a tiny athletic woman. She had to run upstairs, and they said by the time she was in bed, she looked like a dying woman. <laughs> you know, and she was she was able to substitute. So I found basically that it, it wasn't the way Lady Gregory and Yates said that the mothers were there on the inside of the threshold. They were. They were very active. They were pushing people out the door, you know, like Mrs. Byrne, who says, go, your brothers are off, go. When, many years later, the trouble Kate had getting her pension, you know, so um, I, that's a kind of answer to your question. Yeah. Well done. Can everybody just give a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.